Hello. Hi there, nice to see you. You too. I'm not quite sure how long to wait. <laughs> um, uh, about three or four minutes is what everyone else is doing. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you for that advice. That's really useful. Thank you. Where are you in the world, Jenny? I'm in Sydney and so it's 9pm to so have a glass of wine. Oh, good for you. Good for you. I'm working with another guy in Sydney at the moment, actually. So I see him sort of um, Monday and Wednesday mornings and then we start at about um, eight o'clock UK time. And as the as the session goes on to lunchtime, it gets darker and darker outside of this window. <laughs> so it's good to see the, yeah, it's good to see the world working on the other side. Yeah. Well, we've just done our club change on the weekend, so you should have an extra hour of light when you're working with him. Ah, I didn't notice that this week, actually, but I will <laughs> I will look out for that next week. That's good stuff. So we give it another minute or so and then we can get going. I'm curious to know where everyone is. I think it's one of those things perhaps um, we won't have the opportunity to find out. So I'm going to start at 11.04, so we give it one more minute. It's good to have a deadline, isn't it? Okay, so I think I'm going to make a start. So I'm going to share my screen, but also if uh, you want to follow me in a different way, I'm going to put uh, my board in the chat because we might get a little bit of interaction going if we can, depending on uh, who's got uh, who's got the ability to join the board. Ah. We might. So, I'll take two back, right? so the, the board is in the the board is in the chat so feel free to follow me there if you like i'll bring you to me if i remember you can whiz around yourself but i will also share my screen Oh, I don't know. It's, I've not been able to share my screen very well here because it's not my version of Zoom. very well here guys bear with the tech bear with me on the technical difficulties Ah, we've got a problem. Is everyone able to join on my, is everyone able to join the Myro? Because I'm really struggling to share my screen. I'm on the Myro if that helps. And there seems to be quite a few guest editors in there. Yeah, it does look like that. So maybe we'll be all right. 
my technical genius has worked. Sharing <laughs> success. <laughs> we'll see if I try and play a video clip whether it works or not. Oh, it says microphone and speaker are not working properly, but I'm just hoping you guys can hear me. Is that okay? Can you hear me? I can hear you and see you and see your screen. <laughs> oh, well, I think we'll we'll settle for that and we'll get going. Apologies for the delay, guys. Uh, but very nice to see you all here. And uh, I mean, it's a shame that I can't get to know you all. Um, but um, I will introduce myself so that you uh, got a bit of background to me. So I'm Lindsay Parry uh, and Scott asked me to speak after we uh, met uh, in a class that I was running a few months ago. And, um, and my background is very much I live in the UK near Bedford, which is about... Um, 50 or 60 miles north of London, so very commutable. Um, and I spent my formative years in management consultancy and then went into um, retail and worked in uh, change and transformation in retail. And then from there, about eight years ago, set up to run my own consultancy. Uh, so I work independently now and enjoy it very much. Um, I love my family, my garden, my cats, the seaside, food, wine and running when I've got time. Uh, my own business is Leaf Partnerships and I work also as an IC Agile accredited trainer with the Agile company who are a small um, entrepreneurial business in France. So that's me. Uh, I'm so sorry that uh, we don't have a chance to get to know one another better. Um, but you never know, our paths might cross in the future, which would be fantastic. So uh, without further ado, um, I think I'm going to go straight in for the kill and tell you what my, my uh, definition of enterprise agility is. And that is, it comes from being good at change and the process of change and nothing more than that. It's a relatively simple explanation, but incredibly hard to achieve. And so what I'm going to do is walk you through why I think it's important in the world today and maybe what some of the starting points might be for the organisations that we work in and we support at the moment. Um, so there's a, a cartoon here which uh, was written by a forum um, in the UK, the Financial Times, one of our broadsheet newspapers here. And I think it kind of lays out the... The kind of, um, if you like, the crux of what's happening at the moment in the world um, and what we've been through in the past 18 months, which if anyone was ever looking for a case study for enterprise agility, uh, I think we've got a ready made one here. So what is the future of work? You know, so what does it matter? Um, kind of how we execute? What's the context of the world that we're living in now? And, you know, I think it's different for all kinds of people. We're looking at people who have enjoyed working from home, people haven't enjoyed working from home. We're all thinking now, how will the future be? Will it? Will we be in this uh, smaller physical space? Will it be a digital workspace? Will it be hybrid? What will it look like? What do we actually want from that? What are our expectations of our organization and, and that are they reasonable? And in turn, are our organization's expectations of us reasonable given the change that's gone on? And, you know, there's been a lot of talk of as we look into people's homes, uh, it makes us feel more connected to them. It, it's that human side of it. We're not just seeing that work persona anymore. And, and for those of us who have unruly cats or teenagers, it has, of course, been a challenge. Um, the network kind of bandwidth has been an issue with Netflix and, and you can imagine and what else and uh, Playstations and all of that. But we've got through it and we are still here. And, uh, you know, a lot of us are, are managing to find a way to smile and think about what the future will be. Um, but we are in that experimentation stage. What will it be? How, what will be the demands on us? Uh, how could we, you know, maybe take some of the good things that have come out of the last 18 months in terms of our work patterns or our balance between family and work life? How can we take those things and really keep them for the good of the future for ourselves, for our families, for our organisations? And potentially, you know, what, what does life look like? Um, and whilst, you know, we could be here for weeks debating that as a whole, if we narrow in 
to kind of what it means to organizations and our part in organizations, then that really is where I think my definition of enterprise agility comes into its own. And we have seen some organizations, both small and larger, absolutely thrive in the last 18 months. And we can ask ourselves, I think quite uh, in a quite straightforward way, is that because they were adaptable? Is that because they sensed the change, they responded to that change, uh, and therefore good for them, they deserved that success. So, so they were potentially agile organizations. The, the agility wasn't just in small pockets, it was throughout the organization. They sensed, they responded as a whole, uh, they aimed for something new, and they did well because they were all aligned behind that new vision of the future. And I think there is nothing truer than the fact that change has never been this fast and it will never be this slow again. We are getting used to it, whether we like it or not, we are getting used to the fact that change is constant and that it's quick and that the digital world and the speed at which new innovation can kind of land on our doorstep is much quicker than ever before. But I think it's worth taking a, a more personal look, maybe even um, a more sort of enterprise look at the world. And, and we talk about a VUCA world and it, it's uh, it kind of been in the past a throwaway comment and something that came from the military years ago. But actually, when you make that more personal, when you make it more connected to an organisation, you can see potentially the difficulties that are ahead. Um, so from a volatility perspective, you know, volatility is all about the speed of change in an industry. It, the, the, the market change or the world in general, and it's associated with fluctuations in demand or turbulence and short time to market. And it's well documented um, in, in literature on industry dynamism. But the more volatile the world is, the more and faster things change. And we have to keep that in mind. We are dealing with uncertainty. And we've dealt with huge uncertainty over the last 18 months, which has really brought the definition of uncertainty into all of our minds. And it refers to the extent to which we can confidently predict the future. And part of uncertainty is perceived and associated with people's inability to understand what's going on. And we've had a lot of that. Uncertainty, though, is, is, more, is also a more objective characteristic of an environment. Truly uncertain environments are those that don't allow any prediction, certainly not on a statistical basis. There's not a linear way forward. And the more uncertain the world is, the harder it is to predict. And for those of us and for organisations in the past that have been used to planning for the long term, that are very linear in the way that they plan their, their operations and they plan their change, that that's no longer going to be a, a good way forward. Certainly the, the kind of five year transformation plans surely must be a thing of the past. Surely we've learned that, that they are possibly doomed to fail before they even start. The complexity in environments is about the number of factors that we need to take into account and the variety in the relationship between those factors. The more factors, the greater the variety and the more interconnections there are, the more complex that environment is. And under highly complex environments, it is impossible to fully, fully analyse that environment and come to really rational conclusions. The more complex the world is, the harder it is to analyze. So in the past where we might have analyzed the decisions, the way forward in quite some depth before an exec team would sign off on them, that's no longer valuable in the way that it was in the past. And the ambiguity is something that our brains really struggle to deal with. We like certainty and we might like change, but actually somewhere in our, in our unconscious mind, we have made that leap from it being a threat to it being a positive thing quite quickly. And some of us do that much quicker than others. But when a situation is ambiguous, when we have incomplete or contradicting or inaccurate information, it's very, um, it's very difficult to draw conclusions. So more generally, ambiguity refers to the fuzziness and the vagueness in ideas and in the terminology that we might be using. And the more ambiguous the world is, the harder it is to interpret. 
I think VUCA is um, well um, placed now to be added with an O at the end. So a VUCA O world, because how overwhelming is it to live in these kind of conditions when, we, when it has actually been quite a quick and revolutionary, if you like, personal connection to VUCA that the pandemic has given us. So the challenges in organization, the, the, the way in which we engage, the way in which we encourage purpose to be part of what we do now, so that general moving from the, if you like, the very rigid and structured machine-like organization to one which is much more likely to embrace the individual, the individual's creativity um, and the innovation that they bring to an organization. Those things are all still in the mix. We're not there yet. We're not all appreciating those things. And there are challenges for leaders and certainly leaders that I've worked with and I'm sure you've worked with, not used to this kind of environment, not used to the control that they've usually had being no longer as relevant as it used to be in terms of directing the organization. So we are really trying to kind of deal with being overwhelmed with all of the um, all of the different parameters that are currently needing to be balanced and needing to be connected in order that we can really take our organizations and ourselves and our families forward in the world that we've got now. So I guess, who do you, who do you know? What do you know about, whoops, I haven't locked that down. <laughs> I'm very, very happy to share this, the, the, um, to share the slides at the end too, if that's helpful. Um, so um, yeah, so I kind of thinking about your organizations, you think about the skills they require now, the, um, the technology that's moving, the cost pressures, sustainability is becoming much more of an agenda item than it was in the past. Um, and how we employ, uh, how we employ people, whether it's on contract basis, whether it's full time, so that all of these very, very different um, things that we need to take into account in our organisations now. I'm wondering if I could somebody to let me just find if I can mute where I need to mute. Ah, found it. Cool. So I, I'm interested, has anyone got any thoughts about the world and the, the future of work as it stands at the moment? What are, you, what are your thoughts? Or are we not going to manage interactivity? I don't want to put the I don't want to put it all on you, Jenny, because I can see your lovely smiling face and you're a moving image. <laughs> Um, I, I found it um, very interesting um, here in Australia. Um, I don't know if there's any other people in Australia on the call. Um, very much it's, it's been about um, we only employ people who live in the same town or city as us so that they can come into the office five days a week. And some of the some of the um, organisations that I work with, especially in our um seaside towns where everyone moves outside of the cities to go live in the seaside towns all of a sudden yeah. their hiring policies have changed and they're like we'll take anyone that's good enough to do the job and that wasn't a slow change that was rapid and significant and overnight yeah. um, organizations yeah. that were absolutely adamant they would not have remote workers have just flipped overnight fantastic and and i think Certainly, I would back that up in the UK. There's been a huge increase in house prices at the seaside because everyone has decided to move to the coast or to some of our more beautiful kind of regional, uh, rural, more rural areas. Um, and so organisations really do need to, if they need the talent and they want the talent, they need to be more flexible. Um, then I guess the flip side of that is there's quite a lot of us who would really like to um who would really like to have a little bit more interaction and um, and be um, kind of with people a little bit more and a little bit less remote. So uh, we'll, we'll see that goes where that goes to the whole, can we, what kind of hybrid type environment can we make work? Because at the end of the day, the organizations are there to, to make money or to deliver a service or to serve a purpose of some kind. Um, and um, it's kind of for us, I guess, to try to, um, to make sure that everybody has got a, a, a good opportunity to, to do that in the best way that they can. Um, I'm going to share the Miro board again, just in case anyone wants to join us. And I know that Zoom is not great at, um, is not great at keeping the chat alive for people who've joined late. 
So there we go. If anyone would like to join us and you've joined a bit later, if you'd like to join us on the Myra board, that would be great. We might we might get a little bit of interaction, at least on the board in a moment. Um, OK, so thank you, Jenny. <laughs> um, so let's think about the reality of the of the workplace now um, and, and kind of all the different voices that we've got in the workplace because we've got that intergenerational thing going on. So it's not just about the, um, it's not just a, a, a kind of about where we are, it's about our background and where we've come from and our different worldviews. And if we're hoping to make an, a, an organization better at change, then we need to take all of those worldviews into account. We need to try and find, create an environment where everyone can contribute and everyone can be uh, comfortable to, to share their worldview, to think about uh, change in a different way. But we're not all going to come from the same starting point. So the Gen Zs of this world, the digital natives have grown up in a very different environment and, and are very much, you know, they see projects as the way forward. They don't see that steady logical flow anymore. They're saying, of course we get projects, that's what we do. They're looking for the experience. They're not necessarily looking for the single career. They're potentially looking for multiple careers. And, um, and so, you know, but we have to balance all of these to our point earlier, if we want the best talent in the organization, then we really need to be looking across all the generations that are there and that are wanting to work. And there are some really interesting stats uh, about the leadership of tomorrow in terms of the number of careers they're likely to have. So not just the number of jobs, but the number of careers. So the Gen Zs of this world are likely to have, um, you know, potentially five, six, seven careers. There's nothing to say they might not go back to university in their 60s and completely retrain. So it is a very, we're in that paradigm, it's a really big shift going on. And we're just all the time adding fuel to the argument for organizations to be better at change and the process of change. I was going to try a bit of an experiment actually, um, but I don't know if we'll make it work. I'm gonna try because I'm brave. And if it doesn't work, then hey, we'll, we'll move back from it. I was gonna suggest we looked in four breakout groups, um, at this board, uh, I guess it depends. We've got it ten people on the board, so maybe it's not going to work. But maybe it would be a good discussion anyway, even if you can't get onto the board about the different perspectives of dealing of dealing with change. So, how do we think the baby boomers deal with change? How do we think Gen X deals with change? Gen Y and Gen Z. So, if I stop sharing for a moment. and then see what happens if I do four breakout groups. Oh, it's nice numbers. It's quite a, a nice small number of in each group. So that would be cool. So if we did four groups, and I will come and visit all of you. Um, Jenny, because I can see you. <laughs> yep, no worries. <laughs> I am gonna nominate you. Can you consider in the group uh, just, I'm literally going to give you five or six minutes just to say hi and then consider what do the baby boomers think about change? Mm -hmm. What yeah, do the baby probably. boomers think about change? Uh, and then um, I'm going to, oh, who else can I see? I can see Gretel. Hi, Gretel. Nice to see you. Hi. I just joined, so I might be a little bit behind the game. Oh, don't, don't worry at all. Don't worry at all. Um, Gretel, because I can see you, can I ask you when you're in a group, could you consider what Gen X make of change? What do they think about change in the organization? Oh, more people is more people are, are saying hi. Oh, we've got another Jenny, Jenny in Sweden. Hi, Jenny. Hi. If you were to go in a breakout group too, Jenny, would you mind looking at what Gen Y make of change? Just think about what they make a change and then potentially um, feed back to us. And I've got one more. I've got Joe now who I can see. Joe, are you happy to take a breakout group? Sure. That would be brilliant. Thank you. Okay, so what have we got? Oh, yeah, not, not too bad in terms of, I think we've got, let me just even them up a little bit. Uh, hmm. 
Uh, yeah, hi. I'll be joining a different meeting for next 10 15 minutes. So, okay, uh, no problem. No problem. Of course, that's fine. Minutes, yeah. yeah, no problem. Okay, so let me open the group, the rooms. If you can see the board and you can put your comments on the board, then that would be fantastic. But what we're really looking at is for uh, Gretel to be, oh gosh, I can't remember what I said now. Can I have a link? Um, for the board you can. You um, can. and I am Gen X. You're Gen X, brilliant. Is right? just because it's mucked up my it's mucked up my groups now. So Gretel was Gen X. Jenny was baby boomers. boomers. Um, Jenny in Sweden was Gen Y. Was that right? And then I think yes. Joe is going to do Gen Z. Brilliant. Um, so the question, the exam question, the easy question is, what do they make of change? How do they react to change? And I'll set the groups and I will look forward to seeing you. I'll put a timer on the Miro board, maybe eight minutes. So then you can say hi to, which is nice, isn't it? Uh, see you soon. I look forward to seeing you soon.
Welcome back. Oh, there's more faces now, which is fabulous. It's lovely to see you. Really lovely. Thank you for turning your cameras on. It's fantastic to see you. Anyway, I hope that the discussion um, and all of this background really is trying to make the case for enterprise agility. It's really trying to say, look, um, you know, the world is a different place to how it was. It, and then we look at it or we all look at it from different angles. And um, and there's something to be gained by having each of those perspectives in our workplace and being and encouraging them and giving them the different kinds of support that they potentially need in order to engage with change um, in a proactive and a confident way. Because uh, as we all know, confidence makes quite a big difference to our actions and it makes a huge difference to how our skills and our talents turn up in any environment. So there's some great stuff on there. You can keep the link to the board and you can browse through it and uh, and see what you think. So, so thank you for sharing. I wonder if we could just stay a little bit interactive for those of you who can see the board and think about maybe a little bit of a dot vote here in terms of what's most important to you. If we think about it's quite a good um uh, sort of contrast between the, the the world of work in the past and the world of work in the future and what's most important to us you know is is it most important to us to um, uh, to actually be able to work anytime anywhere using any device or actually you know is it still quite important to some of us and it may well be to kind of be on a feel we're in a bit of a corporate ladder. And that, you know, for some people, that's what they like. They like that predictability. They like to know that that's what's next, as opposed to maybe creating our own ladder. So um, it might be just worth thinking, maybe, maybe not in an exercise form now, maybe we don't have so much time, but it might be worth thinking about that. You know, what is important to you? What is important to each of us in terms of how we plot the next few years of our career, uh, given what's happening around us and given maybe what we're wanting to encourage in organisations in terms of agility? And then the final thing before we do actually look at agility in a little bit more detail is the relative importance of skill groups. There's been a huge shift in the last few years uh, around what's important. And the World Economic Forum is, um, is really clearly stating now that that con whole critical thinking, uh, complex problem solving, creativity is right at the top of the list of what organizations need in the future. So the logical uh, linear approach to delivering change as we've had in the past is no longer going to be as relevant to the future of work. So thinking about all of that, let me zoom out and zoom back in again. Agility, we talk a lot about an agile mindset and we talk a lot about um Sorry, what, Lindsay. Yeah. Um, we're we're just seeing the agile company in four boxes. I don't know if the right oh. screen is am I not sharing the right screen? I, I, it hasn't moved on since we came back from break. Oh, so okay, I, I apologize. Oh, you've missed quite a bit then. Thank you for telling me. Let me try again. 
I was following on the Miro board and it looked like people were zooming around kind of following you. It's just. Um, it's always the tech bits, right? Oh, always. <laughs> How about the now? agile mindset as defined as a capability? That's, That's the one. Oh, cool, 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 cool. So I'm sorry you missed the other bits, Joe. Um, but you can whiz around. The board is yours to look at for for however long you want to look at the board. Um, so yes, yeah, so we're thinking about now making a compelling case, if you like, for organisations to invest in being better at change and the process of change continually, so that they can sense and respond and adapt, and be aware of the outside world. And thinking about agility as a capability can be quite a useful way of trying to get that across. So thinking about, um, you know, the, the, the power of this, if we were able to replicate this capability across the whole organization, demonstrating that ability to recognize future failures and challenges as opportunities for learning and improvement, and along with the resilience it's those things that we want as individuals, and that's what gives us our agile mindset, but we want to be able to replicate that at organizational level. And we need to find a, find a way to do that. I mean, ultimately, what this gives an organization is, is speed. And all execs are looking for that, you know, for quality products and services, but delivered in less time, more efficiently, more effectively than before. But the current change programs don't always meet those uh, expectations of speed and quality. So if we've got this mindset where we are continually learning, we are continually adapting to change, then we have got a chance potentially of moving more quickly than the competitors, than we used to, uh, depending on what we're actually looking for. So how can we look at the organisation as a whole? How how can we think about scaling this up? Um, So one of the things I talk about when I do the enterprise agility classes for IC Agile as we talk about taking four different views and looking at the organization as a whole ecosystem or even part of a much broader ecosystem. And and in order to make this, um, if you like, quite structured and quite systematic, we look at it from four sides. We look at the leadership and the individual strengths. We look at the combined capability of the organization. So the observable skills and behaviors, the processes, the tech, the data, the ways of working, the competencies and the products that help together when they're all together, the organization to deliver to its customers. And then continuing round sort of clockwise, the organization's responsiveness, the structures, the systems, the hierarchies that govern how an organization work can help or hinder its ability to handle change and how information flows through that organization can be a real sign of the bottlenecks and the things that are going to prevent it from being able to respond quickly. And then, of course, the cultural landscape, the values, the habits, the assumptions of the group that govern the relationships and in in a way the overall mood of the organization. And combined, these things determine the environment and the patterns of behavior And it's only when we look at all four of those do we get an opportunity to really see the organization as a system, to start to dig under what's on the surface, to get to the root cause of what's stopping it being able to sense and respond to the world around it, and hence being able to be more agile at an enterprise level. I'm just going to show you if I can get this to work with fingers crossed for the tech. I'm going to show you a small clip. So we're obviously not in the next 15 minutes going to talk at all in any depth about systems thinking, but it is fundamental to the agility of an organization for us to be able to see it as a whole and not only focus on the frameworks or on tech or on the, um, if you like, the process side of it, but to see the importance of the leadership and the structure and the culture alongside those processes. Because if we pull the lever at one side, something goes out of kilter somewhere else. We introduce new processes and uh, a new technology and new data. If there's out of kilter with the culture of the organization, then it won't embed and it won't sustain. And we certainly won't get the maximum return on investment. And it's the same when it comes to if we change the structure, but we don't change the leadership. If we change the leadership, but we don't change the process or the hierarchy, it's all interconnected. And this tiny, really little clip that I want to share 
brings that to life, I hope. Fingers crossed. In the 1950s, the Dayak people of Borneo, an island in Southeast Asia, were suffering from an outbreak of malaria, so they called the World Health Organization for help. The World Health Organization had a ready-made solution, which was to spray copious amounts of DDT around the island. With the application of DDT, the mosquitoes that carried the malaria were knocked down, and so was the malaria. There were some interesting side effects, though. The first was that the roofs of people's houses began to collapse on their heads. Turns out the DDT not only killed off the malaria-carrying mosquitoes, but it also killed a species of parasitic wasp that had controlled a population of thatch-eating caterpillars. Thatch being what the roofs of the Dayak people's homes were made from. Without the wasps, the caterpillars multiplied and flourished and began munching their way through the villagers' roofs. That was just the beginning. The DDT affected a lot of the island's other insects, which were eaten by the resident population of small lizards called geckos. The biological half-life of DDT is around 8 years, so animals like geckos do not metabolize it very fast. It stays in their system for a long time. Over time, the geckos began to accumulate pretty high levels of DDT, and while they tolerated the DDT fairly well, the island's resident cats, which dined on the geckos, did not. The cats ate the geckos, and the DDT contained in the geckos killed the cats. With the cats gone, the island's population of rats came out to play. We all know what happens when rats multiply and flourish. Pretty soon the Dayak people were back on the phone to the World Health Organization, only this time it wasn't malaria that was the problem. It was the plague and the destruction of their grain stores, both of which were caused by the overpopulation of rats. This time though, the World Health Organization didn't have a ready-made solution and had to invent one. What did they do? They decided to parachute live cats into Borneo. Operation Cat Drop occurred courtesy of the Royal Air Force and eventually stabilized the situation. There rests my case for looking at the organisation as a whole when you're trying to all. consider agility. <laughs> Look at the organisation as a whole. And, I guess, and, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I wanted to say, I guess they didn't ask the catch the parachute if they like geckos for a diet. They, uh, you know, I had that choice. thought. Uh, I had thought. <laughs> for, for, imagine, imagine you have an allergy to geckos. They just don't. You know, it's, 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 like. They like more Indian food, you know, you don't like very well. Absolutely. You can't really swim your way out of Borneo. <laughs> Poor cats, part of an experiment. But it's just this whole, you pull a thread at one end and what happens at the other if you don't consider the consequences. And, you know, maybe we're seeing that a little bit in some organisations now where they have, uh, we'll all send, we'll send everyone on a safe course and everything will be fine. And, and maybe it won't. Um, so, you know, there's nothing wrong with the safe course. There is nothing wrong with the tools and the techniques that we use. But actually, let's think about the system as a whole if we want the organisation to be able to respond and adapt to change. So helping them to, to look at different ways of working so they can absolutely change gear means finding a starting point uh, for the organisation. And that starting point may well be something quite small that they already do brilliantly. So if we think of the, the characteristics on the screen here as being the, the, the characteristics of an, an agile enterprise or one which can move more quickly, then actually the, they must be doing something right. I'm quite a hopeful person. There must be something in these organisations that they're always already a bright spot somewhere there's already something that they're doing quite well and we're not saying to be an agile organization you have to tick all of these boxes and you have to put them all on a plan and work towards them what we're saying is you find the things that you're doing brilliantly 
and you look at how they support agility and then you multiply it. But you do it by making sure that if you are changing the technology, for instance, to be more enabling technology, that you are also enabling the leadership to take advantage of that technology, that you are enabling the process. You are not leaving the hierarchy as it was. You're changing the hierarchy to be able to use that enabling technology and you're encouraging that within your culture as well. So that you're taking a very broad view of the organization. You're looking at it as a system. And any one of these things that you decide is a good way forward for your organization is going to be taken forward in a really broad minded way and one which looks at the whole ecosystem and how it can be of value. There are a lot of skeptics um, still around the pursuit of enterprise agility and there's lots of wasted money. We need to be really very uh, precise about what we're trying to do. But for me, the most important thing is that that enterprise agility, no matter which of those characteristics your organization ha currently has or they're looking to work towards, they are doing it because they see it as enabling their strategy. They are not doing it because they believe that agility in its own right is exactly what they're pursuing. Agility is not the strategy. It is the enabler of the strategy. So the strategy may well be to increase brand reputation, to grow revenues, to reduce costs even, to, to have success in a particular marketplace. The enabler of that strategy is enterprise agility. It's being good at change and the process of change. And seeing that as a really core element to how they deliver success in the future starts to give us the remit to talk to them about the whole organization and about how they can create the characteristics that will allow them to do that. So my big thing <laughs> is very much agile and agility is not the strategy. It is the enabler of the strategy. It's not the outcome. It's the way to get to the outcome. It's the enabler. It's the ways of working that help you deliver that outcome. And how many times have people seen we're having an agile transformation? Our question to them should be why? Why do you want to have an agile transformation in this organization? What benefit will it bring to you? And we're nearly done. <laughs> As a result of the last 45 minutes or so, wouldn't it be brilliant if you could produce your own enterprise agility elevator pitch? So when someone said, why should I even look at this? Why would I bother looking at enterprise agility? Then you had an answer because the brave new world is one where VUCA is a reality. Change is unavoidable. It's continuous. It's speeding up. It is no longer linear. It is much more complex. It's more about the networks and the connections than it is about the individual plans or the individual components. And the enemy is that we are not great at taking advantage of the opportunities that that constant change brings. Even those organizations that now are doing brilliantly well, brilliantly well, look at us, haven't we done brilliantly? We've survived the last 18 months. We've got a really nice plan in place as to how we're gonna to get to our strategy in the future. But actually, how do you know what that future is going to be? You don't know that. You don't know. You can predict, you can guess, you can plan, but you can't logically draw a line be between now and the future. So you've got to be good at change and you've got to be adaptable. So if we're teasing some promised land, then in a world where the organization and the individuals within that organization uh, are much more adaptable, are much more comfortable or responsive to change, then actually that is going to make a huge difference to the way in which they adapt to both opportunities and the threats. Organisations will help employees to be collectively involved in the change, and we will see it as something that is just part of the DNA of the organisation. And the magic tools to get us there in our enterprise agility pitch, could they just be some of the fundamentals of that agile mindset as a capability? 
could they just be some of the things that we have been working on for many years at a team level that if they were scaled and if they were scaled appropriately, taking into account all four quadrants of that ecosystem of an organization, then potentially what we've got is a chance of being able to respond well, deliver the ROI, feel that sense of purpose and connection to an organization, not just for the next year while the program is in place, but for the longer term and, and feel that real ability to, to help the organization to deliver its purpose. And that surely is going to be a good thing for the profit, for the bottom line, for the planet, and for us as human beings that are hoping to help all of this uh, land well. And that's it. We've got five minutes for a few questions if you have any. I hope it's given you a different perspective and I hope above all um, that you've uh, that you've taken something away for you personally from this uh, dedication of an hour of your time. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Lindsay, that was great. <laughs> You're very you, welcome. Lindsay. You're welcome. You're very welcome. It's very lovely to see those of you that I saw. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank you okay. very much. I'm sorry. You're welcome. I but super useful. Thank you. You're very welcome. Take care all. Bye-bye. Enjoy the rest of the festival. All Bye. the best to success, Lindsay. All Thank you very much. It's very kind. Thanks. Bye. Bye.